Good morning. I want to first thank uh, Dr. Nurmun for agreeing to moderate uh, this session this morning. I also want to thank Ajahn Suchit and most of all uh, to uh, Duncan McCargo. Professor McCargo is a uh, colleague and friend. Started off as a colleague and became a friend. I've known him for almost 20 years. And of course, uh, Ajahn Panitan, my dear friend, whom I've known for more than 20 years. So thank, thank them very much uh, to both of you. This is a rare panel, a, a good, very good lineup. Very rare that you can get Duncan McCargo at the same place at the same time with uh, Ajahn Panitan and Ajahn Suchit. I uh, have a uncharacteristic PowerPoint. I don't like to speak to PowerPoint, but uh, uh, recently I have uh, misspoken or uh, been misreported something uh, like that. Uh, it has been said that I said that uh, uh, President Obama is not going to visit Thailand because we have rejected, uh, virtually rejected this NASA request to do a scientific joint scientific study. I didn't say that. It has nothing to do with Obama visit. He is still my visit. And then to, uh, that the Thai-U.S. relations will not be downgraded. Will not be downgraded. It has nothing to do with NASA. Uh, so just to avoid uh, misspeaking or really uh, being misrepresented or actually misrepresenting myself, I have a short uh, uh, just a PowerPoint that speaks to the, the subject today. Just a few slides, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the reconciliation, uh, elusive reconciliation, and then again the constitutional amendments. Uh, and we've heard uh, some comments already, I think, uh, very helpful comments from uh, Professor Sujit and Duncan and Jan Panitan. This is kind of a archaic system, sorry, but uh, it, it works. But it's a very strange room. Uh, but we use this room because it's the only, only real room that we could use. But we get used to it. And now it's going to take about three minutes for the light to come on, probably. Um, <laughs> Thailand's, you know, all of this is really moot. This seminar is moot. Um, the discussions uh, that we have about reconciliation and charter amendments are uh, moot, meaning that they really don't matter. Things will happen. I think that the, uh, what's taking place in Thailand, the, the, the history of Thai, uh, of the Thai body politic is just unfolding on its own. Then we can do this kind of seminars. We can write and we can talk. And uh, the this Thai crisis has outlasted uh, many diplomats, many journalists, and many many expat, uh, multinational expats, and so on. And it will last some more. So I think that we're in the midst of a, a, a royalist lockdown, lockdown, uh, amidst, amidst uh, a long goodbye. So what does a lockdown mean? You notice that things really don't change. Reconciliation which is, has been twisted, as uh, uh, Duncan McCargo has uh, uh, made clear. So there's all kinds of different modalities of reconciliation. The one that we know in Parliament uh, is peddled by this, this general who staged the military coup, right? So it's a perverse uh, reconciliation bill being headed by the coup maker, the lead coup maker. It has not gone very far. And one puzzle we have uh, in the current political situation is, what happened to the truce? It broke down so quickly. Remember after the floods? It seemed like we had a truce. Ying Luck was getting into the business of governing. She was given a couple of royal decorations. She got to see General Prem. And it looked like there were the signals and signs that could pave the way for from truth to maybe some kind of a compromise. But it broke down very quickly. And one reason is this reconciliation uh, that, that was rammed through, being rammed through, rammed through uh, Parliament. And I see the rejection of this reconciliation bill and the rapid mobilization of the yellow shirts, the multicolor shirts, the Democrat Party as uh, signs that you know this is the par these are the parameters of truce. We can have truce. Ying Lak can be put up with. 
but toxin will not come back. Right? So it's moot, it's gone. It's a flawed process. Uh, the, the concessions that are necessary uh, are just not, not ready. We need concessions on both sides. Now we look at the charter amendments. There's not going to be any amendments. And we must remember this is a constitution that was drafted in 2007 after the military coup by a coup appointed assembly, right? And it's a very crooked constitution. It's got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's not a coherent whole. Uh, it is, uh, uh, has, it's really an anti-politician, anti-political party constitution. When it was passed in a referendum, that the rationale then was to pass it first and amend it later. And this was the uh, suggestion from the military. And there was no other choice. There was even a threat back then that if the Constitution of 2007 did not pass referendum, there would be a coup. You have no choice. Now it comes time to amend the Constitution, and there are a number of uh, changes that are needed. Uh, of course, they will have to be negotiated, but this Constitution, as is, uh, is just not a good document to, to, to govern this, this country. So we, we will see. And the judicialization, the, the judicial intervention that you we have seen in the coming days, there will be a decision on whether this parliamentary initiative to amend the constitution, which is stuck on it in its third reading because of the injunction, whether that it has violated the constitution or not. So you can imagine the the logic is very weak, right? Too small for me. Why would the politicians? They're going to undermine the constitutional monarchy and the constitution that benefit them. I mean, they are the ones that benefit from it. It passed the first two readings. Why not the third? The council, uh, the attorney general's office said it was okay, uh, not a violation. Uh, so a number of questions for the for the judi judiciary, in particular, uh, the constitutional court and Article 68. Now, Article 68 in the Constitution, you don't have to be a legal expert. You just have to be able to read in Thai. It is not meant for the. Well, I'm not going to go too far because you know they have a decision coming. But you read it for yourself. Uh, can a constitution of any country be? Uh, can you accept complaints by just from any individual? Uh, that's hard to imagine. So I think that we will see more judicial assertiveness. And it's plausible to me that there will be another kind of uh, repeat of 2008, uh, 2007, 2008 with party dissolution. But judicialization, which is now the way to do it because military coups are not so popular, not so acceptable anymore. So you see in Egypt, you see in uh, Pakistan, you see in a number of countries now, judicial interventions are becoming more common in place, in some places, in place of military interventions. So you'll see more of it, but judicialization has come up against uh, constraints and limits. It has failed, I said this last time I spoke here, uh, and it will ultimately fail again. It can, it can be done, but the more that they do it, the more they have to exert. And the, the capital that they will lose, the strength that they will lose, and they'll be exhausted. Now the judiciary is not uh, as credible as it used to be. And I think people now uh, in the streets are saying that. And that's very serious when you have normal people, regular people, not relying, not seeing credibility in the courts. And it's difficult now in the past, you know, you say this, the courts, they can arrest you for contempt. Now so many people say it, I don't know who they're going to arrest. The m main characteristic of the lockdown is that the electoral winners cannot rule and the rulers cannot win elections. We've seen this time and again from 2007, December 2007 election, it, it uh, produced uh, PPP governments in 2008, right? PPP government was kicked out. Um, so the Democrat Party-led government came up. The Democrat Party-led government uh, had the MPs in, in the parliament, but they didn't win the December 2007 election. And they had some help from uh, extra parliamentary uh, forces. Now, again, we have 
July. This is, by the way, I just came to realize it this morning that this is the one year anniversary of the election last year. We had an election on July 3rd. So it's only been a year, and the government looks so weak, they have large numbers. They have 300 MPs, but they can't get anything done. They can't move in any direction. Even just a NASA basic scientific research, they, can't, they have to back away because they're afraid of being overthrown. And the forces that line up against them um, make them very afraid. And the, the rulers behind those forces, well, they, they can call the shots, but they have to be able to win the election. What has happened here in this long um, lockdown so far since 2006 really is that apart from election winners cannot rule and rulers cannot win elections, this whole thing is really an insurrection, you know, now that I think of it. I've been thinking and thinking, the Red Shirts, they're really the rebels. Recently we had a commemoration of June 24th, 1932. Big event, you know, big event. Not widely reported in the mainstream media, you know, so if you read the Bangkok Post and the Nation, you'll get about 20% of reality. 12% Bangkok Post, 8% Nation. And then you have all the other um, papers, alternatives, media, and you know, some of the, all kinds of media outlets and sources. And this last week I thought, wow, wow, you know, this is new parameters. So it's really an insurrection, a rebellion that has gone on and on. Uh, in the past, we've seen this before, culminating in 1932. It probably began in about 1912, on and off, on and off, but continuing, festering. When you have you know, suppression, repression, without accommodation, you will have radicalization. And that's why it festers. So this lockdown is very uh, sad and depressing, but at the same time, one has to be fatalistic about it. It's, it's just the way it is, and it's going to be this way for a while. We can have many seminars, it's not going to change anything, but we, we have to, to, to be aware of it. Um, there are forces of history at work now, very difficult for the lockdown to be successful in the ultimate long term. Uh, new norms in democracy, human rights, uh, some of the things that Jan Panitan talked about over the years, over the decades, new technologies, especially media technologies, these are enabling tools that make it very difficult to mold the minds, the new demographics, lots of people now uh, are not born, all my students now are born after the Cold War, they have no idea about the Soviet Union. Uh, this is the 21st century, very difficult to maintain this lockdown, but the lockdown is it's going to be maintained for some time. Why? Because we're in the midst of a long goodbye. The Cold War order has entered, has entered twilight. This is uh, the royal twilight, right? And you, see, you can see that as a metaphor. The, the Cold War order did two things that we must give it credit for. Two things that, that we must not overlook, especially for the Red Church and all the, uh, the foot soldiers of the insurrection. We, didn't become, we did not become communist. We had economic development. This is the reason that Bangkok is such a magnet for visitors, right? Every week, every other day I have a visitor. Either a friend or a family, a colleague, some professor, somebody. Because they, you said, geographically it's very convenient, but then also it's very convenient for uh, livelihood. People like to come here, it's, you know, it's good value, good food, good people. So we had those two achievements from the Cold War order. They, they were costly, you know, they had to suppress left-wing students in 73, 76, uh, especially 76. Uh, but overall, I, I'm grateful to, to those two, two achievements that we've had. Didn't become communist, had the critical mass of economic development with all its warts. What that needs to happen now, the Cold War order, it has to be recalibrated. We, have a, we need a recalibration and a new consensus that people talk about, um, but uh, it has been uh, kind of pushed aside, very elusive, uh, and we haven't really confronted it, the recalibration that we need. Uh, we are in the midst of a long goodbye to this Cold War order in the royal twilight. In this long goodbye, this end game is panning out, is being played out. Don't know how it's going to end, but I can have some, I have some uh, hunches. During this twilight, you see a lot of convulsions, right? 2006, you must see that Thailand is just like shaking up 
up and down, up and down, Sim simmering to a boil, back to simmering to a boil, and now we have a boil uh, this week, next week, uh, this month, next month. These convulsions will, will continue during the twilight. It's just the end of an, you know, the, the end of the rain. And you look at other countries when they have uh, no strong institutions, especially democratic institutions. When you rely on personalities, well, when it passes, there's a passing, a transition. It is generally convulsive. It's not just Thailand. Concessions from the establishment, from the Cold War order. You know, sometimes I call them I call them the Cold War fighting machine. Uh, military, monarchy, bureaucracy, judiciary, they don't make any concessions because the concessions are slippery. I understand them. You make one concession today, you have to make another tomorrow, more next week, and there's no end to it. So they're holding ground. They're holding ground. It's kind of like a shutdown. Holding ground. Uh, but I would say that they have to come up with a new line of defense. This line will not hold. This line will not hold. Uh, they have to draw a new line. So they have to make some, you know, think of the concessions. And this is where we can u really use the third party platforms and modalities because we have no, seriously, no honest broker left in Thailand. We don't have the necessary trust. It has to be trust formation. The new line, that means a little bit of a pullback. So they have to think about, well, some reform of uh, Article 112, uh, some transparency, perhaps uh, of Crown property, some accountability, uh, a number of uh, other things. Uh, can privy councillors sit? Can privy councillors sit on the boards of companies? Uh, things like that, you know. Uh, who has a right to the royal motorcade? I mean, these are small things, it seems like, and these are kind of uh, unspoken things, but. Uh, a new line has to be drawn, and then at that line they say, "Okay, we lock down here." Then they, we might they might be able to do it, but this line, uh, they, I don't think that they can hold it. It's just a matter of being whittling down, whittling down to exhaustion, which leads me to uh, come up to to to, to uh, say few few scenarios. The twilight to me is a dependent variable; it's a given. This is the royal twilight. Uh, what we don't know is how long it will last. So that's the kind of the independent variable. The uh, you know is short, medium, long. Could be long. Could be long. Short, I think maybe one, two years. Medium, three, five. Long, five, eight. Um, so the first scenario during twilight, you see kind of establishment reforms. You know, the perfect. This is the the desired destination. Uh, establishment reforms, adjustments take place, recalibrated constitutional monarchy rises. And it would resemble uh, uh, a little bit more of the Europeans, uh, more of the Japanese, and so on. And this would make it uh, compatible with uh, the democratic uh, institutions and demands. Uh, that's what we could hope for. Uh, and, and to me, that would be the best case scenario. The second, which I think is a likely scenario, is nothing happens, nothing changes. You can try the reconciliation bill, you can try, there can be some true signals, but it doesn't go, they don't go all the way, don't go very far, they don't lead to compromise and genuine reconciliation. So nothing changes, so the royalist lockdown holds, no re legal reforms, everything stays. Uh, you can get elected, you know, you don't you get to govern forcefully, you don't have much of a effectiveness in government, not much stability. Uh, you have these forces uh, line up uh, against uh, elected government, uh, establishment forces. And this, this leads to pent-up anti-monarchy sentiments and eventually lead to explosive changes thereafter. Uh, kind of a forced, uh, the, the, kind of like the first scenario, but being forced, right? Being forced. And in this second scenario, uh, I talked to different people and asked, you know, we, we really have to we have we, we have to prepare for the for the future. Shouldn't we prepare? Shouldn't we make changes that we will need to make and so on? No, because we're in the cash twenty two. The changes that we need to make, the reforms, the best taken now. 
but because now we have to show respect and admiration to the Cold War order, we cannot make those changes. Well, there are a lot of pent up sentiments, and then uh, Hail Mary is how I kind of think of the various responses collectively that I've got from different people. Well, we just have to see what happens. We just have to hope for the best. We maintain the line now and we hope for the best. And uh, yeah, I hope for the best too. So that's, that's Hail Mary, second scenario. Nothing changes, hope for the best. Third, not a good one. This is the ugly scenario. Nothing changes. The twilight moral authority of the Cold War order is increasingly exhausted, depleted, and rejected. It's clash and confrontation. Post-twilight, completely new order. And that is something that we don't want in Thailand. Uh, but you know, if you have uh, suppression, repression, no changes, no reforms, more suppression, repression, you get a lot of anger, uh, a lot of resentment, uh, and uh, you're going to fan the flames of insurrection. Now, I have been very pessimistic. Uh, I do have uh, a positive way to see this. So, John Baytan and uh, Duncan, the, you know, Thai people are very resourceful and resilient. So I think in the long term, I do not, I do not see how this country will go down the drains. Don't, I don't see it. It will have a lot of problems. And you can see that the economy has held up very well under the circumstances. It should be a lot worse. The trajectory is much lower. Before 1997, the GDP for 15 years was about 7.8% trajectory, for 15 year trajectory, right? Before 1997. After 1997, 1998, the trajectory since then is about 4.4%, 4.5%. But 4.5% is not bad. Uh, it, it means that we stay in the middle income trap, but it means that uh, despite all of this uh, nasty, volatile politics, uh, some of it has been priced in, and there's a lot of resilience here. That's why people like to come here, live here, be based here, be different here, journalists here, expats here. We must not take that for granted, but that is the, the strength that I think uh, will carry us through. Uh, ultimately in the long long term uh, because too many people have too many stakes um, in the Thai economy in Thai body politic uh, especially the Thais themselves thank you uh, Peter Jansen DPA German press agency yeah, the, the panelists seem unified in in being very uh, uh, positive or what certain that the the outcome of this constitutional court decision uh, in the coming weeks um, you, what, Pua Thai and the Red Shirts also seem to be, have a foreclone uh, uh, conclusion that the court is going to uh, rule against um, the government. Why, why is it, why is that so, so, seems to be so obvious to everybody that, that the Constitutional Court is going to rule in this direction? And why, why is there no room for compromise with the Constitutional Court, Jim? Dr. Titinan mentioned about the post tie like, completely new order. Can, can we just uh, elaborate more on that, please? I'm a current member of the Yellow Movement. He's a former leader of the Red Movement. We are friends. After this, we go out and drink wine together, trust me. So the Twilight scenario ain't gonna happen. We uh, have conducted uh, our so-called education process in the last seven years, we have educated our followers in such a way that the country will never be the same again. We do not need to rely on the, to, uh, on the elite to tell us what to do. In the last seven, eight years, we have created an education process, a knowledge base that uh, we uh, no longer depend on gamma and have to wait for our turn in the next life and all that. We do question what is happening and all that, so on and so forth. His side too and my side and all that. And both of us in the end are good friends.
you know? We drink wines together, trust me. So there is not going to be anything that is going to be in the arena of the twilight. So trust us. And Chodi Chai Bunya Nichiya Kun from the Junior Chamber International, Thailand. Our private organization uh, was affiliated to the Junior Chamber International in Chetterfield, Maryland. I am the representative in Thailand. Fortunately, this is my first time here. But last week, I also attended about uh, reconciliation and chat in this room by the some organization in Thai language. The knowledge I learned from last week is the best institution in the world is Japan. But in Thailand, there are many different uh, confusion because when you have a democracy in Thailand you can draft a good democracy like uh, like 40 something like that but when when you make a coup something you make a new constitution this one everyone said that oh it's not good why why we say said about every uh, society even in the grassroots level why now we have a good opportunity for all of us to use the best constitution like a Japan to be used in Thailand. But I, I, I don't know because here is a group that we talk today. Why? We should select the one, the best one to be used in Thailand and no need to have a new constitution like a, if you are a democracy government, you draft the, your own idea of constitution. Then if you was uh, there's some crew in Thailand like the last government something like that, you make a new constitution like uh, the selection of the member of parliament. You have elected senator. You have the nomination collector. This is the why. Why Thailand have many many constitution? Why now we are talking about reconcil reconciliation? Why why why? I would like to know. This is my only idea. Just to give uh, some facts on on the national reconciliation, is it very very difficult? I think I think the most difficult uh, reconciliation in the world because both sides, ninety percent, ninety nine percent of righteous don't agree with the reconciliation. Ninety nine percent of yellow don't agree on so and uh, I am since uh, four years three years I am one of the one of one of the few who advocates the national reconciliation and and uh, last last month I went around to Europe to to ask for international support to Thai national reconciliation, and today I am regret that that there are there are few Thai than than European or Asia. So please please support our our efforts. Uh, the conflict and the the fight, the struggle of. Uh, the struggling of fighting bit between the two yellow uh, with with as uh, five years already five years uh, will be uh, there are only two way two ways to end to end this crisis the first the first uh, continue fighting continue fight, fighting and it will take maybe another five years or ten years or even twenty years. Uh, the big side cannot cannot eliminate another side. Cannot cannot. So there are the second ways is a uh, Reconciliation, and which is which is very difficult. Also, so so 
I, I, I on way, I on way speak that until now no one know the end. No one in Thailand know the end. No one. And and uh, now we need we need international support. Three months ago, we spent a lot of money to bring Kofi Annan and and former Finland's president. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, just, just, just to tell Thai people that you should or you must reconciliate and meet uh, Kofi Annan. Find that impossible. He said that impossible. So, so please, please, international community, please support our national reconciliation. Right. Yes, I'm not sure any of those questions were particularly directed to anything I said, which means that I have license to respond in any in any way I wish, perhaps. Um, to be fair, I, I, Ajahn Sujit definitely didn't say that the Constitutional Court was going to find in a particular direction, and I didn't say anything about it at all. So we don't have a consensus on the panel about that point. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that it's quite difficult to know what's going on behind the scenes in Thailand. One can see these pronouncements and indications as signals in a certain direction. They can also be warning signs and part of an attempt to test the public reaction. I think the verdict is very much out on what the Constitutional Court is actually going to decide. I would, I would certainly not want to say that it's definitely going to go one way or another myself. I can't speak for the other panelists, but perhaps they can respond to that. I really do hope that the that. The, the educational process uh, and so on does and Thai society is definitely changing and it's radically different from the way it was a few years ago when I was here you know for a year in 2005 six and coming back again and spending quite a bit of time here recently it's very striking how much the society's changed I, I would love to believe with Kunprida that those changes are basically positive that people's people are becoming more knowledgeable they're becoming more sophisticated in many ways they are uh, I, I hope that that's positive but at the same time we've had uh, despite all those changes changes an incredible period of political upheaval and a series of crises which um, lead one to be slightly worried about the process. So I would, I would love to be optimistic. I try always to be optimistic. Um, I thought the point of the other question was about Japan, actually. The Japanese, the Japanese haven't changed their constitution at all since they got it uh, after the Second World War. And perhaps that's a good example for, for countries like Thailand. You don't actually need to change the constitution that much. You can just creatively work with the one that you've already got. But of course, the most distinctive feature of the Japanese constitution is Article 9, uh, which formally renounces the use of military force. So yeah, uh, the Japanese constitution would be an interesting model for Thailand. You could abolish the military. Uh, I can't imagine that that's going to go down particularly well. Uh, it would be very interesting. It would have been very interesting if, uh, of course, the, the Allied powers at the end of World War II had imposed the same kind of constitution on, on Thailand as they had on Japan. And that's a subject I've often wanted to write an article about. Uh, but that's a, a, a question for another time. Thank you. Peter, I think you, you are quite correct in, in, in saying that uh, uh, you, you find some optimistic uh, feelings among the Thais, uh, not only they are the nature of the Thai people in general, but more deeply uh, when you look into it, uh, you, you think, uh, uh, you tend to think that uh, uh, more and more you see a clear uh, movement of the Thai society toward a more uh, established democracy, although a slower one. Uh, you see uh, limited terms of the leadership. Uh, you see the powers defined by constitution increasingly. The fact that we are drilling, we are debating, we are, we are in conflict on the constitution actually is a positive sign. I remember uh, trying to teach my students about constitutions in the last 15 years. No one interested. But now everyone is interested. I think this is a sign of established democracy. Uh, and more interestingly, uh, people began to detect the establishment forces, especially Kuntaksin and others, uh, uh, previously Mitri and, and, and other elites, trying to manipulate uh, these trends uh, to their own benefits. I think uh, the 
uh, progressive elements in the red shirt saw that very clearly. That's why they, uh, they tried to distance themselves from Kuntaksin. Of course, they still need Kuntaksin to mobilize the masses. But still, uh, this is a very, very uh, interesting and positive sign. Uh, you saw, you saw a, also an in increasing balance of power uh, in terms of uh, legislative, uh, executive, and judicial systems. Uh, although leadership uh, can also push forward uh, to tip the balance in favor of the nation interest, but Kun Ying Lak failed to do that. But of course, the trend is is the same. You're moving toward a more a more a more check and balance. But interestingly, also, Isan people, according to Isan poll, you know the latest poll conducted uh, by Konkan, uh, they said majority of the, of the people, 58 percent, said they don't like the oppositions. Why? Because the oppositions always oppose the government, you see, always oppose. They don't like opposition because they always oppose. They didn't realize that that's the job of the opposition. But soon enough, they know that in the parliamentary system, uh, uh, you, you have mechanism to oppose the uh, uh, executive and check the executive. But interestingly, 41% of the people said they like the role of the uh, Democrats. Uh, this is Isan people mostly because uh, they think this is a check and balance. This is the first time you saw this is mentioned clearly check and balance uh, in the heartland of Thai politics that is Isan. You see, and this is a positive side. Uh, we look at it. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, negotiation compromises already, already uh, is the name of the game. Uh, you saw the con negotiation between the red shirt leaders and the democrat leaders uh, during the uh, demonstration month that's the beginning of the established uh, uh, path so i think uh, this is what what uh, you, you can detect you know what what uh, worries of course uh, 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 people is of course uh, they also find themselves to share the same worries they worry about the king's health they worry about the parliamentary health they worry about the economic health TDRI researcher yesterday came out very clear, suggesting to the government that if the, the government continues this path in the next 10 years uh, on this populism policy, in the next 10 years, he said, uh, Thailand will be in a position like Greece. So I think uh, this sentiment is shared by yellow church, uh, uh, red church, that's why they will go out and drink wine and, and discuss their worries. Uh, and this is, this, this, this is going to form a new dynamics dynamism moving to check and balance their self-interest politicians self-interested individuals who want to manipulate this confrontation it's a contestation between making thailand more democratic to democratic rules not to the constitution rules but of course constitution is part of the conflict that is why leadership is needed to push to push this confrontation and contestation to uh, be more democratic, and, and, and sadly, Kun Ying Lak is not able to do that yet, but I think she's learning fast. I think uh, we're still ho hopeful for her. Yeah. I want to touch on the question about the Constitutional Court uh, verdict. No one knows. They have issued this injunction, so they have to now follow up with, uh, you know, this is a, an injunction against the third reading on the grounds that uh, it has, uh, is in violation of the Constitution, on Article 68, which means that you're trying to change the the, 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 govern, the government system, right? Constitutional monarchy. And the reason that many tend to feel, many would not be surprised if the decision comes out against the government and said that this is a, actually a, a violation, which would then um, be liable for party dissolution. The reason that many people would not be surprised because they've seen it before. They've seen the Constitutional Court uh, uh, ejecting a sitting prime minister because he hosted a cooking show uh, and they use a dictionary definition, right? And then they've seen the dissolutions of these parties based on uh, kind of on weak grounds, uh, the hurried reading on December 2nd, uh, just the, the, the way that it was um, uh, basically coerced and uh, decided. Uh, uh, somewhat in advance. So this is why a lot of people would not be surprised. At the same time, I do have a hunch that they may fudge it. The, I think that in the interim, as things, they, they look at the papers, they look at the sentiments, they look at the, the ambience. 
And if it's uh, strong, like the red shirt, so they're immobilizing, so they might have second thoughts about this dissolving now. They could fudge it by saying, okay, uh, injunction lifted, can set up an assembly. This is only to set up an assembly. It's not changing anything. An assembly, the, the drafting, a constitutional uh, drafting assembly would then amend the constitution. And then they would fight it out in the, in the assembly. And there would be representatives from the, um, from the establishment side, and they would just uh, stymie the whole um, amendment process. And it would take a long, long time, no agreement. And I think that they might fudge it that way. The only other thing I would say in response to Kunprida's uh, comment, it's actually heartening that you know you have a yellow, sh yellow, the yellow side, <laughs> and then red, and here, and they're senior, ye yellow and red. Uh, and the heartening thing is that the degree of separation is very small. The conflict, the gap in conflict is huge, right? Red, yellow. But actually, they went to the same school, they drink at the same pub, they eat at the same restaurant, they have the same network of people, they go to the same funerals and weddings and birthday parties and so on. And that, to me, uh, when they want to make up, when they want to make up, if the conditions are right, it's not very hard for the ties to make up. They'll do it very well. Um, and I, I'm very heartened to see that, in fact. Okay, so I'm Alexandre Tengten, and uh, I'm a law and political student in Belgium. And um, so I come from uh, two uh, unstable uh, constitutional monarchy. But in Belgium, we have this, this, this rule that when we want to amend the constitution, we need a two-third majority in the parliament and half of the, uh, we, we need a, a majority in both community and a two-third majority in the parliament. So on the one hand, it can make the process very long, but on the other hand, it forces us to sit at the table until we have really an agreement and a consensus. And my question is, would you think this could apply to Thailand? Thank you. My name is Pula I'm a graduate, graduate student here, Faculty of Political Science. Uh, what's going on right now in Thailand, the reconciliation and the new constitution dra drafting process in Thailand? From your point of view, it could be the legitimacy crisis in Thailand again. Thank you. My name is uh, Ingo Winkelmann from the German Embassy. Um, and my question is in regard to what, what one observes from outside in this process is that a f frequent referral to the Constitutional Court is made in, in a process with a, in a number of cases. And um, I'm a little bit struck to see how often politicians refer to the Constitutional Court. Um, my question would be, is this a, a new phenomenon for political sciences, or has this always been the case in Thai society that the court was referred so often to in a process which an observer would rather deem a political process and the court should only come into the game in very crucial moments at the very end of a process? Hello, my name is Sapi Pong Supong, a graduate student from uh, Cal of Social Science. Um, my question is that uh, in, in, in Thai society, uh, Thai society have constructed constructed the red as the alternate in our society, and in fact, it was treated as uh, the binary opposition to the yellow shirt. And and we have heard the word uh, reconciliation every single day. My question is that will it, be, it will, will it finally become the meaningless? I mean, the reconciliation. My question is, um, it seems to me that from the panelists there's a difference, there's a divide between the ruling elite um, based in the cities and the um, rural populations. Um, do, you, do you think that this will come to a head in the next few years? And if so, what could possibly happen as a result? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, what was very interesting about the KPI report, which seemed to feed into the reconciliation bill process, was their analysis of the legitimacy question uh, in Thailand. And I, I haven't seen any other sort of official Thai document that goes into such detailed discussion uh, of this this issue. I mean, I've talked in the context, particularly of the South, about the legitimacy deficit, um, which can be understood in different ways. And I talked in the, the 
my book Tearing Apart the Land about an idea of virtuous rule which is one basis of legitimacy and other notions of representative rule and participatory rule and really the KPI report if you look at it closely says there's a clash between two modes of legitimacy one is what they call uh, the executive deriving its legitimacy from the majority rule which you could talk about as representative legitimacy and the, uh, the opposing view this is quoting from the executive summary. The opposing view considers morality and ethical behavior of the executive more important than its representativeness. That's what I call virtuous rule. So yeah, there's a clash of competing notions of legitimacy, which is at the core of all of these conflicts that have been ongoing since at least September 2005. Uh, this is the message that I keep repeating uh, in slightly different words, and I was quite pleased to see that for whatever its problems and the issues relating to the KPI report, they do go to the heart of the problem. I think people, it's not for me as an outsider to say what the basis of legitimacy of rule should really be. Ties have to figure it out for themselves. But there's no doubt there's a fundamental disconnect between an idea of virtuous rule and an idea of representative rule, let alone participatory rule, which is where I don't think we've quite got yet. So I think there is, there, the crisis is a lack of agreement about what the basis of legitimacy of the Thai state is. And that's a fairly fundamental crisis. It's a pretty deep problem. Uh, and that perhaps explains some of the issues issues that were raised in other questions. Uh, did Thais always keep turning to the Constitutional Court? Well, no, because there was no Constitutional Court until very recently. It was only created after the, um, the 1997 Constitution. So it's a relatively recent vintage. Um, it made a few interesting and provocative decisions culminating in the 2001 decision that Ajahn Sajit talked about and then went fairly quiet for a while because Taksin was very uninterested in questions of the Constitution until more recently and uh, didn't seem to want to change the Constitution at all. So there was very little talk about changing the Constitution in the 2001-2005 period and relatively little appeal to the Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court comes back to life again after a royal speech in April 2006 uh, when the, there was a controversial election in 2006 which was annulled by the court and since then the Constitutional Court has been very much in action in its various incarnations including when it wasn't exactly the Constitutional Court during the 2006-07 um, post-coup period. So it really dates from April 2006 is the, is the answer to that question. Um, has reconciliation become meaningless? That's, that's what the, the paper that we're trying to write is sort of discussing. Uh, I think Samana Chan got kind of old and tired. Brong Dong, well, the problem with Brong Dong, it, it's been appropriated by so many different people to mean different things now that it's, it's verging on the meaningless, I'm afraid. I would like to believe that some meaning could be re-injected into these ideas, but it's harder and harder now that the term has been so thoroughly politicized by this recent uh, turn of events to see to see what reconciliation really means in the Thai context. Uh, urban rural divide. I strongly recommend to you a paper recently written by Naraman and myself, which is subtitled "Not Just Poor Farmers." It talks about urbanized villages. I think it's time that people stopped talking about an urban rural divide and started talking about urbanized villages because that's what we argue in our paper. Uh, the main problem is that the urban is in the rural and the rural is in the urban. The so-called rural people are not in rural areas. They're in Bangkok and the five provinces surrounding Bangkok. Uh, the so-called rural areas are becoming increasingly urbanized and are turning themselves into municipalities at a frenzied rate. So this distinction, Anek Lautamatat's famous distinction between the, the rural and the urban, which is based on his reading of Huntington's 1968 classic work, uh, is a very outmoded way of understanding what happens in Thailand because people do not live where they're registered to vote. And we've got a real problem as soon as we talk about who lives where and what people's occupations are because nobody is living where they're supposed to live or uh, you know half of Thailand's population isn't living where it's meant to be living so we can't really talk about urban and rural in the ways that they are constructed in a lot of the literature that's a very brief introduction to an extremely complex topic and i recommend to you our article which was published in asian survey december last year i think the uh, role of the uh, constitutional court is quite interesting uh, if you recall uh, last year when the Democrat Party submitted a petition uh, to stop the uh, emergency decree uh, on the flood uh, budget, arguing that uh, it's not immediate uh, and it, it created a huge, uh, a huge uh, uh, problems in terms of corruption, uh, the court disagreed. The court said it is uh, immediate, it is needed, and it ruled in favor of the uh, government. 
almost a year on, look at the statistics on, on how much that budget is, uh, is, uh, is being applied. Only 10 to 20 percent of the emergency uh, fund uh, uh, requested by that special decree is being paid to the people, much less affected on the grounds. And you know very well that you need to be prepared this year for a new flood. Uh, although it's not, uh, it may not be according to most predictions, uh, it may not be as bad as last year. This is the court. It has its own mind. And it is learning to defy our uh, politics. Uh, in so many cases, rules against common sense, rules against, uh, uh, in the past, uh, what is proved to be uh, uh, an interesting phenomenon like this uh, budget uh, process. Only 20%, less than 20% is approved and used. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, the court this time uh, sensed that there were some manipulations, and uh, not the court. I think the majority, in, including the uh, progressive forces in the red shirt, senses that Thaksin's people may try to manipulate the uh, reconciliation May try reconciliation takes time, needs dialogue, needs engagement, needs months of exchange of views, and more importantly, needs fact finding. Kun Apisit, Kun is willing to go to uh, court. I'm not so sure about the ICC, but uh, we are not uh, ratifying. Uh, but I will not be surprised if we are a member and ratify uh, the treaty. These two people. Uh, may go to that court because they are waiting uh, for the truth to be revealed. And according to some people in the fact-finding missions, they detected some of the very interesting uh, elements uh, within the red shirt, the black, uh, the black, uh, uh, the black soldiers divided up by uh, in, into many uh, more sophisticated uh, sections, not attached totally uh, to the red shirt progressive elements, but attached to some of the wretched radical elements. Uh, I hope this will be revealed in the next few days. And, 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 and we know that, and the court, the court knows that it needs that facts to establish a more long path of reconciliation. This is why sensing that uh, changing the constitution to open up amnesty, uh, amnesty uh, um, law for certain individuals, including people who use the M79 to shoot down over Emerald Buddha Temple, will be granted amnesty, may not be right, and may destroy the whole judicial process in Thailand. Uh, this is why the court stepped in. I don't know what the court will think, but I can tell you that it has its own mind to protect uh, the judicial system in Thailand. And I think uh, uh, it is very clear. Uh, on what the court will, will say on this. Uh, if it allowed to go into the third reading, it had to be some mod modifications to make sure that, yes, democratic rules need to be amended, need to be further progressive. Yes, constitutional rules uh, must be upheld but uh, to the interest of the people. But in the end, it will not be uh, allowed to serve only some individuals. According to the Richard themselves, they don't want Thaksin to hijack the issue and serve himself his own interest by returning to power, by returning his assets, by reward the whole judicial system in the last few years. I don't think uh, most people want that, and the court senses that. But how the court will come up with a more satisfactory uh, ruling uh, for this uh, confrontation or contestation is mysterious to me. That's number one. Uh, number two, of course, uh, uh, interestingly also, the urban-rural uh, 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 phenomenal is intriguing to many of us. In North and the Northeast, more and more people moving away from supporting poor Thai to support Democrats in the urban areas. The Democrat popularity went from 15% to 30%. And more interestingly, in the South, several more moving away from supporting Democrats to support the Red Church, the poor Thai or other parties in the South. The check and balance they fed up the, of the status quo, fed up of the uh, inability to engage uh, into reforms, uh, is more and more you know, being detected. Kun Thaksin's right to a phenomenon high, uh, campaigning only on reform issues, things that he cannot deliver. But people like it. People like it because uh, people know that in the new order, 
we need to move away uh, from uh, from the Thai society. Uh, the formal structure has to change. The formal structure has to change. Uh, people already demand that. But most interesting of all, at the end of the day, informal structure in Thailand, including the Thai people, refuse to change. They are remain, according to B.J. Turbo, very much like Thais from the 13th century. The Thais always have the Thainess in their quality. We don't know what it is, but they won't, they won't change that. So the informal structure will remain and continues. Kun Jing Lan is not even the party head. She is not even the party executive, but yet she rules the country. That's an informal structure that people don't want to change. You know, but yet academics uh, and, and, and progressive forces know that you need to put a new structure in order to cope up with globalization and the new crisis that are coming our way, the new superpowers that are coming up to our way, the Chinese rise, the American return, the Indian rise, the Russian return to Thailand, you need a better formal structure to absorb these changes and people cannot wait anymore. They are now going on the street demanding that change. That's what I'm, I'm thinking, yeah. There are a number of issues. I think uh, Duncan has addressed the legitimacy crisis very well and that really is the root of how to understand uh, this country and its prolonged, protracted political conflict. Different people have different sources of legitimacy. When you hear about good people, you know, the good people discourse is about the virtuous, as Duncan mentioned, um, the virtuous legitimacy. Now, if you hear about uh, parties, elections, and all of that, uh, then they want a uh, representative kind, not even participatory. Uh, now, the court's judicialization, there's actually more literature on judicialization now than ever. In Germany, I think you had a recently a, a, a case of the Constitutional Court also stepping up uh, on a decision regarding the, the Euro. So you will see this more, I think, uh, as an international global trend. For our country, as was mentioned, uh, it really was activated from April 2006. And it has intensified and is going all the way. It's going to be more uh, assertive. And this uh, has pr produced liabilities for the establishment judiciary. And this is why I think that they issued the injunction feel that they are part and parcel with this, that within the establishment, but also very close to the monarchy. All judges swear an oath uh, on taking office to, to His Majesty, not to the Constitution. So when the politicians come in to try to amend the Constitution, of course the politicians, they, uh, they want uh, some payback for all the dissolutions and so on, right? But uh, so no doubt they're going to reduce the powers of the judiciary. So judiciary sees this, Constitutional Court said, okay, um, stop, you know, uh, in their own interpretation. And I think they use that pretext of violations and trying to change the constitutional monarchy as a pretext only. But they know that their powers will be reduced because they've been very interventionist and, and it will, go, it will con it be intensified. So my, my overall kind of uh, dim view in the long term may be bright, it can brighten, but uh, things will get much worse. Reconciliation is not meaningless. It just has to wait for events on the ground to transpire. Uh, in a future juncture, when people have been have put each other down and kind of hurt each other enough and so on, uh, the, the enabling conditions for, for some kind of real compromise and reconciliation could be in place. Uh, and, you know, we have some examples. There will not be another airport shutdown. I think both sides, all sides have known that that's not what we want. So we just have to go through this kind of uh, a catharsis, a cleansing process, during this twilight. Uh, and we only hope that we will emerge with a hybrid of the past and the present for the future. Not a completely new, something of the old, something of the new, and that's what we want.
my duty is to keep up with the time. So I think uh, if anyone have any other question, you can ask the panelists later. And now on behalf of the ISIS and the Faculty of Political Science, I would like to thank our panelists to give the information. We don't need to do any conclusion because the interesting part might be in the next few weeks that you will see from the newspaper and see whether our analysis from Professor Sujit, Professor Makago, Ajahn Titinan, and also Ajahn Panitan, whether we are, I mean, our analysis can help you to understand or read the text be between, I mean, the situation is come out. So now I would like to ask our participants to give a big applause to all our panelists. Okay. Uh,